This is Ella Sever. I'm recording for James Cole. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the second step in your key to life, which is learning to love what is most central to you. Um, and I'd like to actually back this up a little bit and just ask you, how did you kind of develop or realize or just kind of establish the so-called like steps or the key? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, the, the way that we're describing it sounds a little guru-ish and a little gag-worthy. Um, so I got to be careful. I don't know if I have the keys to happiness or the keys to life, but I guess, let me just put it this way. I have, the key, I, I have figured out how to make myself happy uh, from many years of depression, um, as we've talked about, you know, in these videos. Um, so how did I come up with it? Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of at the root of a lot of the stuff that I talk about and think about, and it's been very helpful to me, CBT. I highly recommend it to people. It's different than talk therapy, which is what most people think of when they think of therapy. Um, and then there are lots of books and like podcasts that I've been listening to. My cousin is going to BUDS, which is Navy SEAL training, and I follow a couple Navy SEALs. Uh, David Goggins being the one that a lot of people have heard of, Jocko Willick, um, people like that. Um, I like Jordan Peterson. I don't necessarily subscribe to his political thinking, but he played a role. Matthew McConaughey has a really interesting book. Um, so instead of putting the thinking of a lot of different people into a blender and finding commonalities between Navy SEALs and famous actors and my cognitive behavioral therapist and Stoicism is another one that they all, it's sort of all of that in a blender. And I'm just curious when or how did this all click for you? Was there a, some sort of aha moment or were you sitting down and doing the CBT and it just kind of all spilled out? If you could just walk me through that. Yeah, about a year ago. Um, I guess more than a year ago now, maybe, maybe like a year and three months ago, I moved from San Francisco to New York. I was dating someone at the time. I kind of moved on a whim. I had a friend pack me up and ship my stuff across the country. Um, like I, I just kind of got out. I, I was so depressed that I wasn't even really thinking that clearly, but I just knew that I needed to be on the East Coast and kind of like get a fresh start. And I leaned pretty hard into therapy because I was pretty unhappy. So I had a talk therapist and then started doing CBT at the same time, a little over a year ago. And at times I've done seven hours a week. For, for most of that time, I was doing seven hours a week. So two sessions of CBT and two sessions of talk therapy a week. Um, journaling, meditating, like really putting in a lot of work on trying to understand myself and how I'm put together which is sort of the first step we talked about, like really earnestly doing some introspection, auditing yourself. Um, so it's really been the amalgam of a year's worth of work. And how have you seen your life change in that year? Well, sort of like the protocol I described indicates, I think I've just grown to accept myself. Something my talk therapist said, and I've, I've, worked with the same therapist on and off for five years now. Maybe two or three years ago, he said something that's only just clicking now, which is sort of, at least in my case, I think in many people's cases, like the things that I love most about myself are sort of tethered to some of the things that I historically have hated most about myself that like the DNA double helix almost, it's like one side of it are the things I love and one side is the things I hate and they're interwoven. And you can't have the one without the other. So to be less vague in my case, like my, uh, my creativity, my curiosity, my passion, my energy, my empathy, my like forever wandering mind is also what causes self-doubt, um, insecurity, um, sensitivity, um, reactiveness in a bad way that I sometimes react to things that people say to me or do to me. Like these are two sides of the same coin. And what my therapist said is that you have to sort of take the whole, right? Like you have to just accept it as a package and you can't just sort of say like, I don't like this about myself and I do like this and I'm gonna keep that and fuck that over there. 
that instead that you have to sort of accept it as it is, as it comes. I want to hold on the speed of acceptance for a second because there is there are parallels and similarities between accepting something about yourself and loving yourself, but there's also a gulf of differences. You can love somebody and not accept all of them. Uh, you know, there's the nuances of language, I think, uh, don't really touch on all of these feelings. So how did you go about accepting yourself? And then was there you know, some sort of difference in between the work between then accepting yourself and then loving yourself. Yeah, I agree they're different, but I think one begets the other. Like, I think you have to accept first to then love. Your example of loving someone and not accepting all of them. I, I, I would, I guess I, I don't know if I agree with that. I think, I, I think I feel that you have to accept first to, to love in the, in the least the way I define love. Um, that love is acceptance. So I think the first step is sort of being like, okay, this is the full picture. I'm sensitive. I'm reactive sometimes. I'm I'm uh, very introspective. I'm neurotic. You know, my mind is always wandering and always doubting and always going down different. I describe my mind like a owner taking a dog on a walk where the owner might walk three miles, but the dog is doing nine miles because it's coming, going up and coming back and going up and coming back. And that's how my mind works. Um, so accepting that that's the way I am. I'm sensitive, I'm neurotic, my mind's always moving and so on. And then a question that's asked in CBT a lot, CBT works on protocols. So you get asked the same questions again and again. One of them is, what, is that, what does that say about you? Or what does that say that's beautiful about you? So I might tell a story to my cognitive behavioral therapist about where sort of the key pivotal moment, the fractal as it's called in CBT is my sensitivity or my reactiveness. And what it might reveal about me is that I really care or that I'm really plugged in or attuned or I'm really connected to people and relationships. So you can always reframe some of these things that are ugly into things that are beautiful. So I think the first step is really auditing and understanding like, okay, those are things that I, I am sensitive. That's true. That's acceptance. And then by reframing, like I'm sensitive. What does that mean? Well, it means I care. It means I'm connected. It means that I'm attuned. Um, those are a positive spin, a positive reframe. It's called a cognitive reframe. And that's how you transition acceptance to love. I'm curious, especially in your capacity as a business owner and an entrepreneur, um, a lot of people think people who own businesses are very just like business minded and not as quote unquote creative as other people when we know that there are overlaps or Venn diagrams, um, sometimes complete circles. Um, and so I'm just curious, these things that are most central to you, how do you see them manifesting in your creative life and your business life? And do you see them tapping over um, together? Well, you know, you asked before, like, where, where did this thinking, where, where did I derive this protocol? And I mentioned a lot of things. So just to give you an idea of how similar all of these different thinkers, an actor, a Navy SEAL, a cognitive behavioral therapist. So a Navy SEAL says discipline equals freedom. Matthew McConaughey says conservative now, liberal later. Not uh, politically conservative, but uh, emotionally conservative. Be restrained now to then be free later. I described the hourglass, which is sort of a, uh, a Jungian thought uh, that you go into this tight rigidity of adulthood to then open yourself back up to potential. So it's all this concept of like be disciplined today so that you can be free later. Uh, be conservative now so you can be liberal later. Go into the bottleneck so that you can come out the other side. So the first time I really started thinking about this was like my cousin. I actually literally this morning by complete happenstance watched a few videos that he and I made together a decade ago. He's two years younger than I am, but I look up to him a lot. One cousin I talk about is a Navy SEAL and the other one's a, a cinema, you know, award-winning cinematographer. And this kid, you know, who is covered in tattoos and was kind of the family artist, let's say. At age 19, when I was 21, he was so disciplined. He was so, 
you know, his art, he took it so seriously that if you went on to set with him, he was like militant almost. It was like he was in the army. And I have two dear friends who were professional chefs, like top, top, top. They both won Chopped twice and, you know, flown all over the world for, for their cooking. And when you go into a kitchen with them, same thing, militant, like so precise. A kitchen is like an army barracks. Yes, chef you know, like, you know, you, you, you use almost order. It's like behind, I'm behind you. Um, you know, everything is so precise. Everything is, everything is clean. Everything is thoughtful. Mise en place, like everything is in its place is what, is what uh, you say in the kitchen. So long way of saying like people, amateur creatives, amateur entrepreneurs think that to be creative means to be willy nilly. But if you're actually good at being creative, whether it's being a chef or a cinematographer or a writer, I'm sure you can relate as a writer, there's a, an immense discipline that has to be overlaid uh, to then, you have to learn the rules to break them, right? Conservative now, liberal later. I'm curious, did you ever, were you ever in that amateur space and what did that look like and how did you kind of move out to more discipline? Yeah, no, I was born a professional. Um, no, uh, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reading a book right now where one of the chapters is called Becoming. It's about technology and how everything's constantly evolving. We're all constantly evolving. So, yeah, I mean, watching those videos this morning and watching my storytelling capability and how my mind worked, um, I've evolved tremendously. I think the last year has been a big unlock for me, mostly just because I've become less depressed and I feel like this heavy vest. I'm doing a lot of exercise right now. I have a 40 pound weighted vest that I do things in. And if you do a workout for 30 minutes in a 40 pound weighted vest and then you take it off, it's like, woo, like you feel like you almost are gonna float to the ceiling. Um, and that's how you feel when you get out of a depressive slump that I was in for probably five years. Um, so I'm thinking much more clearly. I'm executing more clearly in my business, in my relationships. I just see the world much more clearly than I ever have through sort of toiling through years and years of, of depressive thought and corrosive um, self-hatred. And I'm curious too, uh, to my mind, and this might be me oversimplifying it because I am on the outside and you're on the inside, but... Um, I think there might be a few parallels here um, with how the hub used to be very diffuse. And now, as you said, you focus on one specific uh, trade for photography. And so that kind of like accepting what you needed to do to keep the business thriving. Um, were there any parallels here into like the learning flow of what is most central to who the business, to what the business is? Yes. Incredibly astute. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like learn, like I, I saw it, right like um this sounds sort of self-aggrandizing but it's just sort of the truth right like the business even to this day but certainly in the beginning was me and i was the business and it's sort of a dangerous way and this happens when you give yourself to anything if you really want something bad enough i was just talking to a college roommate who's an olympic two-time olympic you know runner uh, my cousin the navy seal my my cousin the cinematographer you know my friends the chefs it doesn't matter what it is, but if you really choose your damn sacrifice, as I said before, and really pick a lane and give yourself to it, you become it and it becomes you. Your identity gets entwined in this pursuit. Um, so the company is me and I am the company. So we learn from each other, uh, the company and I. And so I met with a famed investor who told me about the power of restraint in marketplace dynamics and how picking a very narrow niche for a marketplace and starting a flywheel there, Amazon did for books, uh, eBay did with fishing tackle in the beginning and so on. You know, so I, I chose food because I love food, but also because it's just sort of an arbitrary choice and got very lucky when COVID hit that consumer packaged goods were very much on the rise because everyone's home. So they're ordering canned cold brew or you know oatmeal or whatever they want to eat and drink when they're home um so it was lucky but i think the act of restraint wasn't that was a very conscious choice and seeing how well that worked for my business reinforced its importance in my personal life 
Did you ever feel any sense of regret or dismay that you had to just kind of constrain the business down from doing everything for everybody? No, I think anyone who has gone through that transition of trying to be everything to everyone, whether it's a, a business trying to be everything to everyone or a person, you know, my cousin, the cinematographer, when, when he was 19, he would take any gig because he was a starving artist in like deep, deep, deep in Brooklyn. Before it was fashionable to live in like deep Bushwick, he was like, you know, in a little hovel. Um, paying like 600 bucks a month and, and making ends meet and he would take any gig for 50 bucks you know um, and now he doesn't right now he's very prescriptive about what he takes because he's building a reel he's building a story he's doing feature films um, same with chefs they like they develop a voice they figure out what kind of like what comes from their soul authentically like you don't see like someone who's deep in the Japanese canon all of a sudden making like Peruvian cuisine. It just like doesn't happen like that. Um, so I think there's a huge relief that happens actually, you know, discipline equals freedom. Like you, by restraining and focusing and trying it, if you restrain and it's not aligned to who you are, if you haven't done that ever important first step of auditing yourself, and you restrain artificially around something that is not connected to your core, then you're restrained around something that you don't like, and that is prison. But if you understand yourself and you restrain around something that is authentic to you, so a chef figuring out her voice and restraining around that, or a cinematographer figuring out his voice and restraining around that, or me as an entrepreneur or as a human, restraining around my voice there's immense freedom because the world gets very quiet and you're focused on only those things that sort of align to your way of being uh, a lot of your examples have been quote unquote more creative types a cinematographer a chef but is there anything that you think other entrepreneurs or other people looking to be in the business world get wrong about this yeah, I mean, we're flipping between personal and professional because for me, those two things are very intertwined. But, um, you know, like, let's just take it on a personal note, right? Like, um, again, just going back to me as an example, like being very sensitive, being very empathic, like are, are these good things or these bad things? Are, you know, I like the movie X-Men as a, as a uh, allegory, if people have seen that, because X-Men is a superhero movie but they're described, as, they're described as mutants and they're sort of kicked out of their home, their community, because their character trait, their superpower is causing harm. And they end up in a school for sort of wayward mutants to figure out how to hone this thing and figure it out so that they can turn around and hopefully save the world. And I, I think that's how most people should view themselves, right? Like they're in progress and who they are, what makes them most powerful isn't quite honed yet. And so you might be cast out, whether it's by your family or people that you thought were your friends when you were in high school or by your first job or, or by a girlfriend or boyfriend or um, the people that you initially gravitate towards when you're in, in flux, when you're growing and evolving you might outgrow or they might outgrow you because there isn't alignment. Um, but in your personal life or professional life, when you start finding yourself in rooms or with people professionally or personally with whom you are aligned, um, you don't, you don't tend to outgrow those relationships. They tend to fill you with energy instead of sucking energy from you. Uh, do you ever have conversations with other entrepreneurs in which you can just tell that they're not doing that work to really hone in and, you know, siphon themselves? All the time. I mean, entrepreneurship isn't so different than anything else, right? Like you can tell when someone isn't connected to their craft or isn't connected to their lifestyle and they're doing it because, you know, m most entrepreneurs like 
entrepreneurialism has become very sexy in the past five or 10 years, like starting something. I, I think social media has enabled this, like, hey, everyone check out my site. Like it's, I started this thing and it's cool and I, it has a logo and it has a name and I'm like, I'm so brave for starting something. And I see a lot of people do that. And then sort of like, you know, after the first two, three, four, five, six months run out, you know, Mike Tyson says everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face, right? You get punched in the face once or twice. And like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, this isn't so fun anymore. Um, I think if it's aligned to your soul, then you can push through that pain. But if it's not and you get punched, you're like, I don't really love this that much. And it's not very fun or comfortable. So why am I doing it exactly? And some people will hold on in that state for six months or a year or two. And it's very ugly. I mean, it's very, you know, and most entrepreneurs I talk to that are in the first two years are like that. 90% of startups fail, right? And a lot of people will blame it on, you know, lack of capital or market dynamics or any number of things. But what I always say is like this, the company fails when the founder quits. You know, there are lots of stories of pivots. Pivots are sort of held on high in, in Silicon Valley. Like Slack is, are you familiar with Slack? So Slack is, you know, for those people who don't know, it's like AOL instant messenger for businesses. You can like chat with your team very easily and quickly. And it, it's a wonderful tool. And for the, you know, people probably don't know this, but Slack was started by the guy who started Flickr, which was a very big photo community in the early 2000s. And so he raised a lot of cash out of the gate, like almost $20 million. And when he had $5 million left, uh, and sorry, the, the Slack was a business to consumer gaming company. Did you know this? Business to consumer gaming company. So they were making like really hip, you know, a, a, a cool, fun game, right? Uh, like uh, for people to play. Um, and it wasn't working. And he told his team in tears that they were going to have to shut down the business. And he went back to his investors that he cared most about and said, I'm going to give you your money back. This, you know, we have 5 million left. I'd rather you just have the cash than burn it. We're not going to make it. And uh, Mark Andreessen, who's like a very famous investor of Andreessen Horowitz, basically said to him, well, you know, hold, not, not so fast. Let's talk through this. Like, I still believe in you as a founder. Like, you know, there must be some things that are working. Let's really do the audit, right? Let's really like think about this. What's going well, what's going poorly. And they talked through it for an hour or two. And what they came up with was that this chat tool that they were using just internally, they had like a team of 40 and their engineers were using it and product managers and they were all chatting internally to build more efficiently. And everyone was using it. They were using it on the weekends and they like everyone loved it, right? Um, and so they decided that they were going to make that the product and pivot from being a business, business to consumer game company to a business to business chat company, like a totally different thing, completely different company. And so the new Slack was born and evolved and raised more money and now is worth, you know, over $5 billion. Um, and so most people, when they hit a wall, just stop and that's quitting. And other people hit a wall and find another way and that's a pivot. And the only difference between a pivot and quitting is whether you stop. You just spent a few minutes on the Slack story. I'm curious, what do you really like about it? what I just said that, you know, pivots are celebrated, failure is celebrated too in many ways. But to me, a pivot is just sort of a funny idea because it's, it's literally a failure followed by an adaptation. Like this failed, let me try something else. And so if you slow it down, it's a failure followed by a rebirth. And a true entrepreneur, a true artist, you know, like, what do they teach you in second grade when you take an art class? It's like, there are no mistakes, right? Like, oh, you squib squiggled a line, like turn it into a, the tail of a dragon, you know, like it, it can be anything, turn it into something new, find beauty out of imperfection. That's what art is. Um, 
So I think if you have a deep desire and a deep alignment in what you're working on, you can make that squiggly line into something. You can find a way to adapt and a company is over when the founder puts down his or her sword, right? Um, and I live by that code. So people confuse something. Failure, there's a badge of pride around failure in Silicon Valley. True, but it's only failure in service of adaptation that I respect. Like failure is part of the process. You fail and you learn and you fail and you learn and you fail and you learn. But if you, if you learn more times than you fail, I respect you. If you fail more times than you learn, I don't. You have to persevere and push through the failures and learn from them to get to where you're going. Um, and if you give up and just end on a failure note instead of a learning note, then it's an act of cowardice as far as I, you know, it's, it's, it's akin to putting your, your weapon down in battle, you know? And then I guess my last question for you is uh, a little petty, but why do you think so many people just don't really get to that stage of loving what is most central to who they are? Well, I think the first thing is they don't actually do the work to look at the picture you know, to, to take a drone photograph of their soul and be like, this is, this is all of it. You know, it's scary. It's like, some, sometimes it's hard to unearth because you're emotionally repressed or you're not practiced at it, you know, so it's hard to even verbalize who you are, what you care about, or, you know, I just was born with a brain that, that did, that did this, as I said, sometimes to, to my great benefit. And oftentimes I would be so in my head that I would just be my own worst enemy and destroy myself. That was most of the first 25 years of my life, maybe the first 28 years of my life. So I think most people just don't even get to the point where they have a full picture to even decide if they love the full picture. And then for the rare few that do get the full picture, they're like, I don't like those things. I kind of just like these things and they repress or, are shameful of aspects of themselves. And you need to sort of, there are things you can strengthen and work on, of course. It's not like you have to just relegate yourself to being okay with everything just as it is. The idea is that you improve, but the things that you cannot change about yourself, you have to see all of it and love all of it. And I, I think people just don't even bother to see the whole picture. And then once they do, they want to eliminate 10 or 20% of it and never look at it again and put it in a shoebox. But you have to really pick at it and be like, how could this be beautiful? In what rooms would this be beautiful? Who would appreciate this? And put yourself in those rooms more so you can train yourself to see, say, my sensitivity as a beautiful thing, not a, not a, it's not a defect. It's not a mutant gene. It's a superhero trait. 